The Night Beat starts right now. I don't want anybody to go through what I'm going through. <laughs> Biological, grandparent or not, when you love a child, you love a child. A grandmother sharing her unimaginable grief tonight. Her five-year-old grandson found dead in Colorado. The suspects arrested in connection with his death, the boy's mother and her boyfriend. Good evening, Joe. Hope you're doing well. I'm sorry to call so late. This is Tommy Calvert. A voicemail back to haunt a Bear County commissioner. At the center of it all, a robbery case involving a world champion boxer. Vandalism in San Antonio schools, the viral TikTok challenge that's most likely behind the damage, and a warning to students involved. And we begin tonight with now Hurricane Nicholas strengthening to a Category 1 storm. Part of the Texas coast already feeling the impact. That storm already bringing in heavy rainfall, strong winds. Let's check in with meteorologist Adam Kasky, who's tracking exactly what we need to know about Nicholas. Yeah, Nicholas right now affecting the upper Texas coastline. Earlier this evening, Matagorda Bay area, especially Port O'Connor, and we'll go live there in a moment, it now stretching off to the north, basically zeroing in on Galveston. Category 1 hurricane, it really was upgraded just a few miles per hour from a high end tropical storm now to low end category one. The impacts are still going to basically be the same, but we do have maximum wind gusts up to 90 miles per hour. Maximum steady winds on the north side of that center at about 75 miles per hour. Now the track from the hurricane center takes it toward Houston as a tropical storm tonight into tomorrow morning and then slowly arcing eastward toward Beaumont and then into parts of Louisiana. The slow movement is going to mean a lot of rainfall for parts of the immediate Texas coast and especially stretching into Louisiana. I wouldn't be surprised if this track actually gets nudged a little farther to the south than its current state. I'll back to, be back to talk about rain, where it's going to go, who's going to see the most of it, and a look at those wind gusts coming right up, Myra. All right, thanks, Adam. We want to turn now to our team coverage tonight. Meteorologist Justin Horn joining us tonight from Port O'Connor. Justin's been out there getting a firsthand look at what Nicholas is bringing in all day. Justin, now a hurricane. What are you seeing out there? It doesn't seem quite as bad as it did earlier where you are. It's not. Winds are starting to calm some. We're still getting some gusts up around 30, 40 miles per hour, but winds are starting to subside. I want to show you what's going on here behind me. I know it's kind of hard to see here, but this is part of a roof. Came off a house and we saw a lot of shingles blowing off. There is quite a bit of damage here in Port O'Connor. Roofs, uh, trees, and power is out to the entire city as a lot of power lines have come down. I want to show you some video from earlier, what we experienced, and the winds were really strong. We did get some gusts, we think, about 70, 72 miles per hour with this storm as it came through. A lot of heavy rain. We also got a storm surge somewhere in the neighborhood of around three feet. Uh, it did come up quite a bit. Uh, come, it came over some of the roads. Uh, but all in all, that has subsided. The rainfall obviously is gone. We're just left with some breezy winds tonight. There is going to be some cleanup to do, though, tomorrow. Once the sun comes up, uh, again, they're going to be picking up branches, trees, power lines here. We did hear of uh, some damage to a few of the restaurants as well. And, and this damage was pretty localized to right here in Port O'Connor. And as this storm moves away, there is going to be probably a little bit more damage uh, up the coast as well. But things are improving here, and that's good news tonight, guys. Hey, Justin, I know throughout the day that you've been talking to people who have decided to stay there. Uh, are, did people get out? Did you see people once the storm got more intense leave that area or are most people just kind of like we've been through this before, we're going to stay? Uh, these these folks are seasoned veterans. Uh, most stayed and I, I will say that I think this storm caught a, a few people by surprise. We were expecting this to be a big rainmaker, and I think here in Port O'Connor, the winds were actually the bigger story, and they came up pretty quickly. But uh, most people stayed, and again, the damage is probably minor damage, but there will be some cleanup to do tomorrow, guys. All right, Justin, thank you. And we will check back in with Justin a little bit later in the newscast. In the meantime, our coverage of Hurricane Nicholas continues online right now at KSAT.com.
A grandmother of five-year-old Dominic Aguilar Acevedo is speaking out for the first time since he was killed back in July. San Antonio police arresting the boy's mother and her boyfriend after his remains were found in a different state. The distraught grandmother tells the night team's Jaffney Gray she's dealing with the loss of two grandchildren instead of one. Um, just devastation. I'm heartbroken. It was only through social media Tamara Ashendorf says she learned her five-year-old grandson, Dominic Aguilar Acevedo, had been allegedly killed at the hands of his mother's boyfriend. I mean, I literally hit the floor, like, what is going on? An arrest affidavit says on July 24, Daniel Garcia struck Dominic so hard he bounced off the wall and hit the floor at a San Antonio hotel. The next day, Dominic died. His mother, Nicole Aguilar, told the FBI Garcia had been abusing Dominic for three weeks before that fatal blow. The affidavit also states, Instead of reporting his death, Aguilar and Garcia buried Dominic's body in a Colorado ravine before taking off to Costa Rica with Dominic's three-year-old sister. Aguilar's mother tipped off the FBI that she and Garcia were in Costa Rica. Both were arrested and extradited to Florida in late August. But Ashendorf says her granddaughter is still stuck in Costa Rica in foster care. I've tried to reach out to my own resources, even the embassy there in Costa Rica. You got to fill out a bunch of paperwork. I mean, I've tried to call attorneys and it's like it's a no win situation because she's in a different country now. So every day it's phone calls, phone calls, phone calls. Who can help? Who can help? I'm still stuck. As Ashendorf continues her search for answers, she says she is raising awareness about child abuse. I feel like he's a monster, but I just have to pray because you Hate isn't going to do any good. You have to pray. This isn't God's hands. How anybody could be so mean to a five-year-old boy who's very, very happy boy, it makes no sense. Now, Garcia is now in the Bear County Jail for serious bodily injury to a child resulting in death. His bond set at $500,000. As far as Aguilar, she's awaiting extradition back to Bear County from Florida to be formally charged. Live from the Bear County Jail, Daphne Gray, Case at 12 News. Thank you, Daphne. A Bear County commissioner tried to get involved in a robbery case involving a world champion boxer. The defenders uncovering Commissioner Tommy Calvert tried to go straight to Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez for details about Jamal Charlo's case. Calvert sent the DA a voicemail. Take a listen. This is Tommy Calvert. Um, I was just calling about the uh, Jamel Chalo uh, issue here. I'm trying to uh, get an understanding, a little concerned about the potential public relations fallout, but um, I'm not completely sure of all the, of all the facts I've heard one side. The voicemail was left on August 24th. Gonzalez did not receive the voicemail until two days later. The district attorney responding back to Calvert via text message stating he would not speak about the case since it was a pending investigation, according to a copy of a text message released by the DA's office. And Charlo turned himself in at the Bear County Courthouse on August 25th. That was more than a month after the robbery at a bar on UTSA Boulevard. Charlo charged with three felony warrants for allegedly assaulting a server and taking off with her tips. Calvert released a statement today about the voicemail saying in part, quote, I will say that I called with the intent to find out the facts of the matter and found the facts by calling the police department, end quote. He said he was given misinformation from a constituent about the case and stepped back after learning the facts. We now know the name of a woman who was found shot to death feet away from her home on the southeast side. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office identifying her as 50-year-old Maria Calvillo. The shooting happened Saturday morning around 530 along Caton Avenue. That's near Rigsby Avenue. When police arrived there on the scene, Calvillo was found dead in the front yard with a gunshot wound. Police did detain one person at that scene. No word yet on any possible charges. New tonight, the Northeast Independent School District is the latest victim of a cyber attack. District officials informing us of a breach that happened back on the, at the end of August. According to the district, a payroll employee who handles wire transfers was hacked. The hackers tried to change the bank where the money was being wired. The district system notified them of the hack before any money could be transferred. However, that payroll has access to other employees' personal information, so the district is unsure of what other information the hackers actually got access to. 
About 5,000 employees, both current and past, have been informed of that hack. The Texas bail system changing after Governor Greg Abbott signed a Senate Bill 6 into law today. It's known as the Damon Allen Act. It now requires people accused of violent crimes to post the amount of cash set by the court instead of from personal bonds. The governor says the law will make it harder for dangerous criminals to be released on bail. But those who are against the new law worry it'll create more overcrowding at jails. And public defenders in Bear County say it will affect their defendants the most. All of our clients in the public defender's office are indigent, meaning they don't have money for an attorney. And if you don't have money for an attorney, you certainly don't have money to post bond. Another concern, restrictions on charitable bail and how hard it will be for judges to issue PR bonds on certain cases. The Damon Allen Act goes into effect on December 2nd. Still ahead here on the night beat, millions of children under the age of 12 still waiting their turn to get the COVID-19 vaccine. How the FDA authorization process is going as COVID cases among kids continue to rise. And coming up, it's a TikTok trend like no other that's causing any ISD parents hundreds. Why several high school bathrooms are being damaged, all for online views. Some students in Northeast ISD having to pay up after most likely taking part in a latest TikTok trend. And this, take a look here, is the result. The devious lick trend encourages students to apparently steal random items from schools. And it's hitting any ISD bathrooms. These just some of the photos of that damage from broken mirrors to soap dispensers ripped off the walls. The district says students even stole a fire extinguisher. There is a huge difference between a harmless prank and something that causes damages, causes destruction, and is stealing property. Um, you know, those kind of things are just not going to be tolerated whatsoever. Several students have been identified as the culprits, and NAISD officials expect to pinpoint more. They say those students will have to pay for the damages. Meantime, in Northside ISD, they also reported vandalism in at least six of their high schools, but officials there are unsure if it's related to that TikTok trend. Well, parents are anxiously waiting for the COVID vaccine to be available to younger children. This is the FDA with a stern warning not to seek vaccinations for children ahead of FDA authorization. It comes as more than 1 million children across the country have tested positive for COVID just in the past month. The country now averaging 1,200 deaths a day, six times the death toll just two months ago. The desperate reach for vaccines just as millions of students return to school. Take a look outside with live cam this evening. We saw our own small impacts of Nicholas earlier today, some rain, some clouds, but really, of course, as we saw, a little bit earlier in this show, the Texas coast feeling the most of it, Adam. Yeah, and really a confined part of the Texas coast where we had the high winds, and that was especially along the western edge of Matagorda Bay. And one reason we think that's where we had the more damage because it was the long fetch where the water, where the air, the wind travels over the water and not over land where it creates more friction and slows down the wind. Anyway, there was a confined area and we're going to go to Justin here in a moment. Not much additional rainfall around here. Actually, little to none. A little breezy. We'll have some wind gusts up to 20 miles per hour tonight and into tomorrow out of the north. And that's going to help actually keep temperatures down a little bit, not overly hot. And we'll take a look at what you can expect temperature wise in a little bit. First, let's talk about those wind gusts. OK, this is the most these are the most recent reported gusts. If you have interest from Rockport, to Port Aransas, to North Padre, all the way down through the land cut. Not a problem. I mean, we had some wind gusts up to 40 miles per hour earlier today, but generally they were in the 30 mile per hour range. Where we saw the highest wind gusts, Port O'Connor actually, their sensor got knocked offline, most likely because of a power outage. So I believe that's a communication issue rather than an actual sensor failure and being destroyed by the winds. Nonetheless, Matagorda, actually measured sustained winds of 76 miles per hour with gusts just over 80 earlier this evening. Most recent gust Palacios 53 miles per hour, but they did have a gust in excess of 75 76 miles per hour 
earlier this evening. So these are where the highest wind gusts are confined to that small part of the Texas coast. Uh, luckily, a fairly uh, rural part of the Texas coastline there. But this is all stretching northward Galveston, even toward Houston, some wind gusts up to about 50 miles per hour. Speaking of the wind, we have Justin Horn, if he's still live out there. Uh, let's go to Justin, and you talked a little bit about the damage. How, how high were the winds in your neighborhood? I know you talked to somebody with a weather station there. Adam, from what we could tell, uh, winds were about 70, maybe 72 mile per hour, miles per hour. Those were the gusts. We think we had sustained winds maybe a little bit lower than that, 60 miles per hour or so. But it was definitely enough to do some damage. And we're still seeing a lot of that across the Port O'Connor area. If you look behind me here, that's uh, part of a deck there that uh, just blew over. And so it, it gives you an idea that the, the strength of these winds. And there's still a lot of debris over a lot of the the, road, the roadways, uh, a lot of trees down. We're seeing that. And power lines. Power lines are the other issue. If you look down this way, all these houses are dark. The entire city of Port O'Connor is dark at this point and without power. And that's probably going to be for a while, uh, just based on, on what we're seeing here uh, and talking to some of those crews who are out there working. Uh, there will be a lot of cleanup to do tomorrow once the sun comes up. Thankfully, things are getting better. Winds are starting to subside. And the rain has, has ended here, Adam. All right, thank you, Justin. Stay safe and uh, try to get some sleep tonight as well. Uh, here's a look at the sustained wind forecast. This little red area indicates that small area of hurricane force winds as they move on shore overnight tonight and dissipate as well as this interacts with land. It's going to weaken. Houston could have some wind gusts of tropical storm force strength, maybe even up to about 70 miles per hour as a system moves in. Now, as for the rainfall, this is just riding right along the immediate Texas coastline and the heaviest rain in the main rain shield is going to stay right along the upper Texas coast and then move its way into Louisiana as well. That's through tonight, tomorrow, and even on into Wednesday. So Louisiana is going to get a lot of rain from this just through Wednesday evening, an additional five to seven inches. Uh, Galveston area all the way through about Lake Charles and other parts of Louisiana. Around here, little to no chance all the way through Friday this weekend. The upcoming weekend, we could have a few pop-up showers. Today, from that one band that moved through, 13 hundredths of an inch, but a high of only 86. That's not bad. Right now, we're at 75 degrees. It's pleasant outside. We're mostly in the 70s. Bernie at 70, Port SA 76. And right now, in Converse, it's 74. And we'll start the day tomorrow near 70. Some clouds in the morning, then a decent amount of sunshine into the afternoon. The off chance of a rogue shower early. Otherwise, generally a sunny and quiet day, just a little breezy at times, a north wind at 20 miles per hour. And once we get toward the end of the week, generally dry, mid 90s by Thursday, Friday, slight chance of showers into the weekend. Thank you, Adam. All right, news out of Cowboys camp and it again has to do with COVID. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, it's, it's the adage of one step up, two steps back on the ladder here as far as the Dallas Cowboys are concerned. When we come back, they get more bad news at the same time. They got a little good news and new starting quarterbacks of both UT and a and for very different reasons coming up. Casey will start this week at quarterback. Hudson will play. And there it is, the official announcement. The Texas Longhorns are changing quarterbacks after their blowout loss to Arkansas, but not the only team in big board sports, but first. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Good news and bad news when it comes to the Dallas Cowboys. Unfortunately, more bad than good. Dallas has activated star offensive lineman Zach Martin off the COVID-19 reserve list, but unfortunately, they have placed defensive end Randy Gregory in COVID protocol, and it gets worse. Wide receiver Michael Gallup is in place on injured reserve after suffering a calf strain during the Cowboys' 31-29 loss to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers last Thursday night, meaning he will have to miss at least th next three weeks before he can return sometime in October. Today, head coach Mike McCarthy was asked how much does it help that Amari Cooper and CeeDee Lamb are so versatile? Well, it's really the flexibility of the whole group. I mean, I think it goes goes beyond CeeDee and Amari. You know, and it really extends to Cedric. I mean, I think Cedric is, 
as fine of a, of a young receiver, you know, that can play multiple positions. And you know, in my, in my past experience, that that's that's the only way we ever operated was every receiver had to play all four positions. You know, Noah Brown's the same way, and and that's 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 the format of how we're training all of our receivers as as they come into our program. So, and this is one of the reasons why you do it that way. Cowboys travel to L.A. to face the Chargers on Sunday at 325. Getting blown out by the Razorbacks in Arkansas, 40 to 21. Longhorns head coach Steve Sarkeesian to making a change at starting quarterback. Hudson Card is out and Casey Thompson is in. That's after Card struggled against the Razorbacks, completing 8 of 15 pass attempts for only 61 yards. His night was done in the third quarter when he tried to scramble. Zach Williams knocked the ball out of his hand. That fumble led to a touchdown and an insurmountable 33 to 7 lead. Thompson would come into the game, lead the Longhorns on two scoring drives, but too little too late in the Horns' first loss of the season. Both guys have been battling. Both guys have been keep competing. I think it would be good for Hudson to take a little bit of a deep breath coming off of last week's game. And it would be a great opportunity for, uh, for Casey to step in and, uh, and battle and compete with the ones early on in the ball game. So I uh, feel good about that. We'll see if that works against Rice Saturday at 7 in Austin. The fight Texas Aggies are also making a change at quarterback, but out of necessity. That's after Haynes King has cracked in his lower leg, according to his head coach, prepared with surgery today and will be out at least a month. It happened in the first quarter. The Aggies comeback win against Colorado and Denver when King was brought down by Colorado linebacker Guy Thomas. King would return to the field on crutches and is now out until mid-October. That means Zach Calzada is the Aggies' new starting quarterback after leading the Maroon and White to the game-winning and only Aggie touchdown, an 18-yard pass or running back Isaiah Spiller to win the game 10 to 7. We put together a 13 play drive and go all the way down and lose the ball on a half yard line going in the end zone. Instead of putting her head down, come back and make an 11 play 77 yard drive and win the game. I mean, there's still a lot of perseverance in that. And for a quarterback to be able to do that after having a tough day, struggling the things he did, and we made some tight, we started, we weren't making contested throws, all of a sudden we did. Start making contested catches, all of a sudden we did. Start breaking tackles, all of a sudden we did. Making blocks, all of a sudden we did. Finding ways to get it done. And there's something to be said about that. The narrow defeat of Colorado has dropped the Aggies to seven, the latest Associated Press College football poll before they host New Mexico on Saturday at 11 a.m. at Kyle Field. The big game and our big game coverage next. The big game and our big game coverage this Friday night is a doozy. Wagner will face undefeated and third-ranked Smithson Valley at Ranger Stadium to kick off play in the difficult District 27-6A. The Thunderbirds come into the game with a 2-1 record that includes huge wins against Stevens, 69-0. Loreto Alexander, 41-3 for a combined 110 points while only giving up three. Their only loss is to undefeated Johnson in their season opener, 21-13. The Rangers have been on a roll with dominating victories over Warren, Madison, El Paso, Eastwood, averaging 34 points a game while giving up only nine. Now these two high school football powers collide in their district opener. They have like a really confusing offense. That's all I really know. And they do a lot of like reverses in the backfield and stuff. A lot of power run and don't pass as much. So this year, uh, now that we've seen it, we should have a pretty good chance of stopping it. Then we went to overtime last year. They're a really good team. So yeah, we know what to expect from them. This game is, is really important because, you know, if we beat them, I mean, it really sets us up in a good position, you know, to keep going. And the momentum carrying from this game to a game like Steel and stuff like that, you know, it's really good. Yeah, this is huge. Kickoff at Smithson Valley on Friday night. It's at 7 p.m. and KSAT 12 Sports will be there live. Look forward to <laughs> it. You're looking forward to it. Yes, the whole week. Yeah, thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. All right, before we go, we have a chance to show you a live cam from Galveston tonight. This gives you an idea of what they are facing there from now Hurricane Nicholas. Yeah, I believe this is right along the seawall there. You can see those lamp posts shaking, tons of wind, tons of rain as well. Although we, when we checked in with Justin earlier, Adam, Things where he was in Port O'Connor, they seem like they'd already seen the worst of it. Yeah, Port O'Connor's on the backside. All the rain has ended there. Now it's headed toward Galveston where they've got some wind gusts right now. Uh, between 50 and 60 miles per hour and likely to get a little bit higher here as the night goes forward. No big impacts around here. We're just looking at some sunshine, upper 80s tomorrow, uh, mid 90s by the end of the week. All right, thanks Adam. And thanks for watching at 10 o'clock. GMSA at 4.30. <laughs> Good.